Hello, this is Ryan Roy, and welcome to Common Scenarios for Character Animators. As the name implies, we're going to be taking a look at things that every Lightwave animator will run into, some of which are simple on the surface, but can be difficult to figure out how to do efficiently. To begin, I'd like to cover motion modifiers. Most viewers watching this will probably already know what I'm talking about, but I want to make it absolutely 100% clear what they are and what they are for, and point out the tools related to them that you'll be using most often. This will likely be the most boring part of the entire series, so I apologize in advance and promise that it will get much more interesting in other videos when we start applying the concepts that we learn here. Okay, so what is considered a motion modifier? What exactly are they? A motion modifier is any tool or function that changes something about the position, rotation, or scale of an object without applying keyframes to it. If you select a bone, object, light, or camera and hit M for motion options, you can choose a motion modifier from this list. As a character animator who has worked with Lightwave for many years, I will tell you that I only use about five of these items, if that, on a regular basis, so don't feel like you're missing out by ignoring a large chunk of them. In fact, many of the items on this list are depreciated, so refer to the Lightwave user manual for more details on that. If the motion modifier listed here isn't in the Lightwave manual, assume it's depreciated and that it's likely been replaced by a better or more updated tool. I'm actually not going to introduce you to motion modifiers through this list. I would much rather show you the tools that you'll be using very frequently as a 3D animator. Instead, we'll explore the Controllers and Limits tab. This area is the weapon of choice when setting up constraints. Alright, so I have two nulls here with item shapes applied. The pyramid is animated, but the box is not. What if we wanted the box to follow the exact path of the pyramid? How would we do it? Well, one way is to make the box a child object of the pyramid. The problem with doing it this way is that now the box is part of the pyramid's hierarchy. If the pyramid scales or rotates, the box is going to be affected as well. We don't want this. So while the classic trick of having two copies of an object and dissolving between a parented and unparented version might work in some cases to do things such as grabbing an item, avoid doing it because it can introduce a lot of extra unnecessary work and complexity to your scene. Let's try a different approach. With the box selected and the motion options panel open, in the Controllers and Limits tab, you'll notice three sub-tabs here, which you may already be familiar with, Position, Rotation, and Scale. It is through the options in this area that you can assign the movement, rotation, and scale of the selected item to that of another in addition to applying things such as inverse kinematics, targets, etc. Same as item does exactly as its label suggests, and it is the single most important motion modifier to be aware of as it'll be used frequently in every single video in this series. Now when we select the pyramid in this drop down list, the box is following on its position only. So I can still rotate and scale the box freely, but now it cannot be moved because the same as item constraints are being applied and are overriding any user interaction. We can turn off specific channels as needed. If I turn off the Y position controller, now the box is moving but is effectively stuck to the floor. We can manually keyframe the Y position now but the X and Z channels are locked because the same as item constraint is applied to them. I'll enable same as item on the Y channel again so that I can demonstrate a few other concepts. Now remember, this box is not receiving any keyframes, despite the fact that it is moving through a same as item constraint. So if I remove the same as item constraints, the box goes back to its original position and we can once again move the box freely. Let's see what happens when we reassign the same as item constraints and then create a few keyframes between 0 and 20. Something you'll notice is that the motion path suddenly appears. 
This motion path represents the movement of actual keyframes that are placed into the timeline. If I move the pyramid on one of its keyframes afterwards, and then reselect the box, you'll see that its motion path now differs from its actual movement. This is not an error. This is because these are keyframes that were created by the user, not by a motion modifier. If I remove the same as item constraints from the box, observe that the motion where we keyframed is intact. The takeaway here is that when you create a keyframe for an object that is being controlled by a motion modifier, it effectively records the position, rotation, and scale data at that keyframe. By doing this, the user can apply a same as item constraint, create keys, remove the same as item constraint, and then have unrestricted control over the object while retaining the motion influenced by that same as item constraint. There's a few other things that I want you to be aware of before we can really get our feet wet with this stuff. First, I'll delete the keyframes we created for the box. Now, notice this thing labeled interpolate. What is it? This is the overall strength of influence that the item chosen here has over the currently selected item. I'll reassign the same as item constraints to demonstrate this real quick. So at 100%, the item is completely obeying the same as item constraint in relationship to whatever is shown here. Whereas at 0%, the same as item constraints are effectively turned off. You can envelope, or in other words, animate this to transition the effect over time. Okay, moving on. You may notice this little world checkbox. What is this vague, uninformative label referring to? It's not doing anything when I click on it, so why is this even here? Basically, do you want the item to follow the object's actual position or its position relative to its parent's origin? This was a confusing concept to me as I was learning light waves, so let me explain this visually. Here's a scene with three knolls, with the smaller pyramid a child of the larger one. If we want the box to follow the smaller pyramid, let's see what happens when we assign a same as item constraint for position. Ah, oh, this is bogus! It's not doing what I expect it to! Okay, not to worry, there is logic in this. I want you to note that the difference between the origin center and the box is exactly the same as the distance between the large pyramid and the small one. Even if I resize, rotate, and move around the big pyramid, the box isn't budging because all it's looking for is the distance the small pyramid has been moved directly by the user. If I rotate the big pyramid 90 degrees and move the small one along its y-axis, which is on its side now, the box moves up. This is because, relative to its parent, the small pyramid is actually moving upward. Also, notice that the numeric values displayed in the lower left corner are identical between the box and the small pyramid. This brings us to the world checkbox, which, in almost all cases, you want to have checked when using same as item constraints. When it is checked, Notice that the box snaps to the actual world position of the small pyramid no matter how its parent moves. At this point, there are several workflow problems associated with this part of the motion option panel for position, rotation, and scale. So let's explore some issues and the solutions to them. Problem 1. You can only pick one controlling item at a time. Pretend these two boxes are elevators and you want to have this ball travel upward halfway in one box and halfway in another. The fastest way to achieve this is to keyframe the ball following one of the boxes, reassign the controlling item midway, and keyframe the second half. After removing the constraint, we end up with a motion that gives us this result. So we took advantage of the motion modifiers, but we didn't have to do much by hand. Problem two, 
Drop-down lists are your enemy. Picking the controlling item becomes a nightmare in large scenes. If I drop in, uh, say, 500 nulls and then try to pick something, yeah, I think you get the idea. My god. Assigning items through this panel is a time sink. This is the reason why we have assigned tools and layout as of Lightwave 11.6. If you are using an earlier version of Lightwave, you can download it as a plugin for free. Take a look at the assigntools.mp4 file for information on how to get this assigned tools tab set up shown here. To put it in simple terms, select an item you want to follow, hit store selected, pick the item you wish to be affected, and assign position. It simplifies the work that we'd otherwise be doing in the Motion Options panel and turns everything into button presses instead. It saves a ton of time. The tools also automatically check the World option for you, which is what is used most often. You can also use Assign Tools to assign parents to items as well without the need to even open the Scene Editor. Something that I highly recommend doing if you intend to do a lot of animation work, is to make the following functions of assigned tools hotkeys. You may use the menus if you want, but to keep the content of this video series moving along quickly, I'm going to be using mostly hotkeys instead of this menu tab. One other thing is that I recommend installing the Mental Fish Motion Baker plugin if you don't already have it. It is the only fast and reliable tool out there that I'm aware of for quickly keyframing motion modifier animation over large numbers of keyframes. Check the resources and links text file for info on where you can get this and other free useful animation tools. Finally, there's an important thing that I need to cover about same as item world rotations. Same as item world rotations are very important in the workflows covered in this video series, but they use quaternion elements to operate. This means that you'll occasionally encounter sudden flipping or unexpected rotations after baking the keyframes and removing the same as item constraints. In this case, the hat is not rotating correctly in relation to the green knoll. When this happens, you need to run an Euler filter on those items to quickly fix those issues as they occur. Please refer to the Pitch Correction 2 supplementary video for more details on this. Okay, that covers the basic stuff needed to get off the ground. All of the other videos contained within the series revolves around specific scenarios that you are most likely to run into when animating. Every video comes paired with two sample scenes, one being empty so that you can follow along, and the other serving as a completed example. Also, I have provided some props and a simple rigged character. This is a 100% IK Booster rig, but I want you to know that the methods that I'm going to show you throughout this series are mostly rig neutral with very, very few exceptions, which I will point out as we get to it. If you really prefer a full-time IK rig, I've included a Genoma variant for your convenience. With that said, there is one more introductory part before we can get into the main content. Please watch the intro assigned tools file before you look at anything else as it details the functions that we'll be using to make everything happen.